Can you define the word paradox? You know what a paradox is? How would you define it? It's two opposite things put together. Okay. It is a statement that seems contradictory, but yet it's true. That's what a paradox is. The Bible is full of them. The Bible is full of paradox or language. In fact, the overall theme of 2 Corinthians is a paradox. Remember what it is? Just learned it this morning. It's weak. When you're weak, you're strong. Okay, yes. The strength of weakness. The strength of weakness is the theme of the book of 2 Corinthians. And I'd like you to turn to a section in the book again, this time chapter 12. Chapter 12 and verses 7 to 10 is really the section that the theme for the book really comes out of, and so clearly. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll begin looking at verse 7 and end with verse 10. I'm sure you're familiar with this passage. It's a passage that we learn that Satan brought pain into Paul's life. And God taught Paul how to turn pain into power. And guess what? Any believer can do the same thing. You don't have to be the Apostle Paul to be able to turn whatever pain you have into God's power. Obviously, Paul was talking about a physical pain, but it could be any kind of pain. It could be mental or emotional pain. You can turn into God's power. And so I want us to see how the Lord taught him to do that. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, we see how Paul was afflicted. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8, we see how he appealed or pleaded to God. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9 and 10, we see how God did transform that pain into power. And so I want to look at those each separately. Let's pray first. We thank you, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the fact that you can do miracles. You can do miracles. You can turn pain into a powerful thing in the believer's life if we let you. Lord, I pray that you'll give us insight this, this uh, very afternoon regarding this important uh, paradoxical statement, the strength of of weakness, how we as believers in our weakness can actually experience God's power. Make this real. Make this practical. Cause it to be remembered by us. Let us see it activated and proven to be true in our own personal experience. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at verse 7 with me. I'm going to read it. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations. Now, we are told by Paul that he had been given visions and revelations of the Lord. The Lord gave him visions and revelations. He was the apostle. And he talks kind of in a different person, about that in verse 2, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knows, such an one caught up to the third heaven, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knows, how he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which are not lawful for a man to utter. 
But you can imagine how that could give any person, any believer, a big head, right? And so that's what we read in verse 7, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Look at how that thorn in the flesh is described. The messenger of Satan to buffet me, to beat me, lest I should be exalted above measure. I want you to see in verse 7 how Paul was afflicted. He called it a thorn in the flesh, or literally a thorn for the flesh. Now, the word thorn is very significant. The word thorn actually refers to a pointed wooden stake. Have you ever had a garden? Have you ever uh, taken a stick or a, a piece of wood and put a point on it and then took a hammer and pounded that little piece of wood or stake into the ground? That's what he's referring to when he talks about a thorn, like a pointed piece of, of uh, wood stake that, it, that is driven into his body and impales him. Now, you're talking about a lot of pain by his very description here. So painful. It was some bodily ailment. It really doesn't matter what it was. It was some physical ailment that he had that he calls this thorn in the flesh. But what I want to you to, you to see is the fact that verse 7 says that God gave him that thorn. That God gifted him this terrible pain. And this will really rock your theology. Not only did God give him the pain, but God used Satan to give him that pain. He says in that seventh verse that this thorn in the flesh was given to him by God. It was the, he called it the messenger of Satan to beat him up, to buffet him. Now think about that. Satan's attack on Paul's body was God's gift. Well, that will make your head spin. How can that be? I would simply say this. Because God is who he is. Because God is in sovereign control of everything. He can take a rebellious being like Satan. And uh, rebellious followers of Satan. And he can use them to fulfill his purpose. Think of Job. Guess who instigated that? Guess who it was that, in a sense, indirectly, sicked Satan on Job? It was God. He specifically pointed Job out to Satan. Have you considered my servant Job? Hint, hint. Wow. And yet, look at what Job suffered. That was instigated by God. Well, how does that fit with what the New Testament says? Because as John closes his first letter, he says, the whole world lies in wickedness. And he, and he says, that, that the believer, the person that's born again, he says, the devil toucheth him not. So how do you put all this together? Because clearly the devil's touching him here. The devil's touching Paul here, inflicting bodily pain in his life. I think what we should understand is that the devil does not touch a believer unless the devil gets God's permission to do so. Nothing is allowed into the believing life without, first of all, passing through the Lord. He has to approve everything that happens to us. Now, 
when you think about that, you might think, whoa, then I'm really mad at God. That he permitted that into my life. That he permitted that affliction. Well, I don't know if that's how Paul felt, but he sure wanted to be free of that pain that was afflicting his body, just like any human being hates pain. Look at what he did. He pleaded, having been afflicted by God through Satan's touch. In verse 8, he pleaded with God. For this thing I besought, and the word besought, I called upon God. I called God to my side to help me. I besought the Lord not once, not twice, but three times. I pleaded with God three. I called God to my side three times. I pled for God's help. I pled for him to give me relief from this pain, to deliver me from it three times. But God each time said no. Sometimes that's the way God answers prayer. Sometimes God says no instead of yes to our prayers. Well, why would he do this? Certainly not to be mean to us. I think it's because God is all wise and all knowing, and we're limited in our wisdom, in our knowledge. And God, as the all knowing, all wise God, realizes that in removing pain at certain times from the believer's life, we would lose. We'd be the loser. God envisions in Paul's case, something better, something more important than the relief of that pain. And so God allows it to remain. And the thing that uh, we read here is that God allowed it to remain to keep Paul humble, to keep Paul from having a inflated, exaggerated sense of self-importance. So he gave him a continual reminder of how weak he was through allowing this pain that Satan inflicted upon him to remain. And it was an important reminder to Paul that he needed God's enablement. It was an important reminder that you can't live without God's power in your life. Whether it be with pain or without pain, but when you have pain, you're more dependent upon God, I'll guarantee it, than when you're not. It was Paul's reminder that, you know, you're not high and mighty because I chose to give you these visions and these revelations uh, such that no man could should even utter them. And so he learned to be thankful for his thorn. In fact, he says in the ninth verse, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. He learned to be thankful to God for it. You know, I really believe that that is the first step to any relief in the Christian life is that whatever the problem is, whatever kind of pain it is, that we learn, first of all, to thank God for it, even though it hurts, and even though we may not understand why, say, God, you're the all-wise, the all-knowing one, and I thank you because you know what you're doing. And Paul learned to thank God for his thorn, and I think so do we. There's only one way to ever do great things for God, and that is to live out of a place in which we can't depend upon ourselves. We can't depend upon our strength. In fact, I read that uh, an opera singer said that he hired a teacher, a voice teacher, even though he was a professional uh, opera singer with this op beautiful operatic voice. He hired a voice teacher because he said 
you always have to have an outside source to check your voice and uh, and your abilities because you don't have that ability to keep to uh, to detect it yourself. And then he said, and the secret of singing is to let the let your breath flow freely from your diaphragm. The way in which Christians live the Christian life, the way in which believers serve the Lord, is to let the breath of the Holy Spirit flow out of their hearts freely. And that is because you're depending upon him and not yourself. He was afflicted. He pleaded in prayer and God said no. So what happened? Well, in verses 9 and 10, his pain was transformed, and it was transformed into power. And I want you to see this with me in verse 9. God's answer to Paul's prayer was no, and then the explanation. He said to me, my grace, and I've, I said this morning, when you see that word grace in reference to believers, you should uh, always be reminded that that's about ability. That's about strength. My grace or my ability, my strength is sufficient for you. The word sufficient there is the same word in Philippians 4.11, I think, where Paul said, I've learned to be content. I've learned to be sufficient, meaning that he has found his sufficiency in the Lord. And so Paul says, my grace, God told him, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect or complete in your weakness. The word strength in that ninth verse is the word that we get our English word dynamite from. My TNT, spiritually speaking, is sufficient for thee. And also, he says, my strength, my dynamite, my power is made perfect. That is, it's brought to completion. How? Through human weakness. God's power is brought to completion in our lives through our human weakness. But I want you to understand the word weakness here. In, in this uh, ninth verse, it's very important that we understand what this word means. It's from a, it, it uh, originates, the root word is uh, stethanos. We probably get our English word stethoscope from it. And it, it stethanos speaks of vitality, of life, of strength. In the Greek language, which the New Testament was originally written in, whenever there is the prefix A before a word, it negates the word. So if the word is strength, if there is an A before it, it means without strength. And so what Paul is saying here is that God's strength is made perfect, is brought to completion in human beings that recognize that they are totally without any strength at all, any strength whatsoever. When he says, my, my strength is made perfect in your weakness, weakness is that you don't have, you don't have an ounce of strength. You have absolutely no strength of your own. That's where God brings you to so that he then can fill you and complete his power in your life. And so Paul is telling us how our weakness, our helplessness can be transformed into God's strength, God's power. And there are two things that God reveals 
his ability to transform that are negatives in our lives. The first one is strength through weakness or spiritual power, where a person voluntarily accepts this weakness because while Satan, they realize, is the one that is doing it so that he can neutralize that believer or destroy that believer, God ordered it to humble and to keep humble so that that believer can be continually usable for the Lord. And so rather, rather than asking God anymore to remove it, he then depends upon God to supernaturally give him power in his pain, to transform his pain into God's power in his life. That's the first thing that verse 9 tells us about, that God transforms pain into power. It reminds me of a story, true story that I read of a missionary. He was, uh, he was a believer that was very well trained academically. He was a graduate of both Yale and Harvard. He had a degree, a, a PhD in theology, as well as a medical degree in tropical diseases. God called him and his wife to Africa. They went to Africa, and when he arrived in the country of Liberia, he was offered a job to be the head of one of the, the, the largest medical facility in the country. But he turned it down because God had called him to minister out in the interior. And he and his wife traveled for seven, 17 days on foot. And one day they stopped on the side of a uh, river. And while they were resting, his wife said to him, look, there in the trees, they're staring at us. Faces staring at them. And he said, honey, we found the place where God wants us. And so they built a house among these people. And they began to minister to them. They started having church services. No one showed up. Not a single person came to their church services. He offered medical services to these uh, people. And um, one day he was sitting in his office. And he said he saw his little son running by the, uh, by the riverbank. And he uh, fell. And uh, got up again and ran a little farther and fell. And this repeated several times. And all of a sudden, the doctor realized what was happening. He went out and he grabbed his son and he, he brought him in. And he realized that his son had contracted some horrible tropical disease. But he said, if anyone can cure him, I can. But all of his knowledge and medicine that he had with him didn't work and the little boy died he went out and he got some wood and he constructed a, a box just big enough for his little boy's body and he laid the body of his little boy in that box and he nailed uh, a wooden lid on it he put a rope around it, he put it on his back, and he was carrying it through the town, and the people were not saying anything. They just looked at him and nodded. The blacksmith in that village came to him and said, I'll help you, and he took one end of that little casket, and they carried it way out, away from the, the village where they could bury the... the uh, the little boy, the blacksmith helped him dig the hole and they got it deep enough, put the little casket of wood down in that hole. He helped him cover it up with dirt. And at that point, the, the missionary doctor, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't contain himself any longer. 
and just fell down on his knees and put his face in the dirt and just sobbed. Why? Why, Lord? And the blacksmith reached down and grabbed him by the hair and pulled his face out of the dirt and turned his face to him and looked at him and then dropped his head again. And he ran back to the village saying, the white man cries just like we do. He went back, went back to the town, to the village, and they had a church service and everyone showed up. And the place was packed. And God began to work in the hearts of those people. And many of them were saved and came to Christ. Have you realized that the way that God gets ministry done is through suffering? God had to send his son to suffer in order for us to be redeemed and reclaimed. And God used the suffering believers in order to bring people to himself. And Paul understood that. And God used his pain and transformed it into power. But also, he transformed that pain not only into spiritual power, but into pleasure. Look at what he says in that ninth verse or and tenth verse. I'll glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Verse 10, therefore I take pleasure. I delight in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. So God wants to transform pain into power, but he also wants to transform any sorrow into pleasure. God is able to supernaturally give his people joy in any kind of affliction we ever suffer. How does he do that? Well, see the word infirmities there in verse 10? That's the same word weakness. It means absolutely without any strength, not having any whatsoever. And he's talking about Physical bodily need, infirmities, where you are totally, you have total inability. You're completely running on empty. And you exchange your total emptiness for God's power. So there's no question who's doing it at that point, And that gives pleasure. See the word reproaches in verse 10? That refers to hurt. That refers to emotional abuse. And if you exchange your offenses for his forgiveness, for his forgiving spirit, I should say, you'll have the ability to forgive anyone, no matter what they've done to you, and you can claim it. So the question is, no longer, how did he do that? It'll be clear that God enabled you to forgive. And then see the word necessities in verse 10. I believe that that probably refers to material or financial needs because of circumstances. And you can exchange your needs for God's sufficiency. So no one will question who supplied all your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. In verse 10, see the word persecutions? It means to be pursued. It means to be hunted down by people that want to hurt you, people that want to neutralize your testimony and even destroy you. He says, he transforms persecutions into pleasure because you are assured of God's promises, and your hate is exchanged for his love. Isn't it interesting that Jesus says, don't hate your enemies. Don't hate those that persecute you, but love them. Pray for them. Do good unto them. And there's pleasure that comes. 
from the Lord supernaturally in that. It'll be very obvious to your persecutors who's enabled you to move forward and to love them regardless of what they've done to you and caused you to suffer. It's happened. I've read testimony of that. And then in verse 10, one more time, see the word distresses? That word distresses refers to a narrow place between two walls where you're in a tight spot, what we would call between a rock and a hard place. You can, ex I believe that that distresses refers to, to mental pressures and mental stress. And you can exchange your mental pressures and stress for his peace, for his tranquility. So no one will question who's the source of your calm and your tranquility that you enjoy and that you exhibit, and thus you take pleasure in distresses. If we remember and learn what Paul learned, to always make this exchange, whether it be infirmities of the body, whether it be emotional abuse of reproaches, or financial need of necessities, or persecutions, or distress, mental pressures. If we remember and learn to always make these exchanges, you and I, like Paul, will experience a supernatural transforming of the results of these negatives in our lives. Our weakness will be turned to power, and our sadness will be turned to joy. The weapon that Satan planned to use to conquer Paul actually turned out to be the weapon that Paul used to defeat the enemy. And we are now more than conquerors through him that loved us. Christians have exclusive access to supernatural power and pleasure through God's grace, through God's strength, through God's fruit joy of the Lord that comes by recognizing God's presence with you in your life. Do you know how natural pearls are formed? How many of you like oysters? You like seafood? You like oysters? Yeah. Yeah. Good. I like them raw. Yeah. I like them uh, roasted. I like them deep fried. I like oysters, period. But I'm telling you, every time I've opened an oyster shell, I've always been looking for a pearl. Never found one yet. But you know how pearls are formed? Actually, pearls are the result of a grain of sand that gets lodged inside the oyster shell on the oyster's body. And the oyster naturally secretes a substance to put a buffer around that irritating piece of sand. And that buffer over time grows and grows and that becomes a pearl. In the center of pearl is a grain of sand. And that I think is a wonderful uh, illustration of how God can transfer or transform, I should say, a piece of dirt that injures us into a thing of beauty, into a thing of power, into a thing of value, the value of a natural pearl. But it's the result of hurt, of suffering. That's the value of our suffering. And that's what it means when we say, and Paul says, there is the strength of weakness. Weakness realized, God depended upon, and strength derived. That's the pearl in the life of the believer. 